Anya Markhart is the creator, writer, director, and co-executive producer of the third season of The Girlfriend Experience on Stars from Riley Chow. The Girlfriend Experience this season, I would say, has a more striking opening than maybe any other show that aired in the last year. Uh, just, yeah, those opening minutes were so engrossing and so different from everything else. Uh, can you break down what you're trying to accomplish with those first set pieces? Thank you, Riley, for having me. Um, it's fun that you bring up that opening sequence. I had in mind something that would lead us into the uncanny valley without giving things away too much. I wanted um, the audience to find our new lead, played by Julia Goldani Tejas, in, in sort of the striking world of, of infinite white. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a fun sort of collaboration between in-camera work, location, and a tiny bit of visual effects. Okay, what about going even further back? Uh, I understand that you were initially adapting a novel uh, for this season, uh, whereas now it's more of a standalone original work. Uh, what happened to that novel? That is an interesting, yeah, that's correct. I, I started when I was brought on, I, I think the novel was going to be underlying source material and I was really smitten by it and uh, sort of the it was very different, had sort of a human rights component that I was really into. But then things really changed in, in the cultural landscape and, and over at the network. And ultimately, um, the, the idea was to go to London, to break it open, to make it more international. And I think what um, happened then, I was tasked with coming up um, with a new original take. And, and that's how we ended up in London and in the tech world. Do you want to name the novel or is it secret? It's not secret. It, uh, it's, uh, the novelist is Alison Leota and she had written a piece specifically to be um, potentially the underlying material for season three. Uh, now, I feel like I raise my eyebrows a lot at these uh, arbitration decisions by the Writers Guild of America, probably because I only ever hear about them when they're more questionable. So I was very surprised to see that you actually got a created by credit on this third season, uh, considering it's you know, a continuation of the show before and also the film. Uh, is, is there any insightful story behind that credit? Um, I think, you know, as you say, to some degree that there is a bit of a mystery with the whole process. I think if you look at the shows and anthology, um, where every season is really unique, I guess it made sense for this third season to be a standalone um, work and also for that to be reflected in the, in the credits. Though so, um, I'll be the first to say that season one and two um, started the, um, the show and I had, uh, I'm just a big fan. I had nothing to do with those first two seasons. And, um, they, you know, created the show in a way that I think is really unique in the television landscape, um, back then when it started, but also still now, I think there's, I can't think of any other show out there where every season is really its own, um, creation. Yeah. That first season I'd say is one of the underappreciated shows, you know, of the last decade and also underappreciated performances. Uh, this season is more of a return to that single protagonist formula, uh, as opposed to you know, what they did in the second season. So I'm wondering, uh, since it is more, uh, it's closer to the first season, uh, what did you want to bring from the second season into the third season or uh, not bring? I think a quality that I appreciate uh, about the, the second season is it's just bold filmmaking choices and, um, you know, a reflection of, of very filmmaker driven television or storytelling. So um, in a way it was a really um, luxurious opportunity for me to just come in and get the best of both worlds. That there is a strong sort of foundation that was established by the franchise and the, um, the underlying film as well. And then to also be told, okay, be bold and now make it your own and, and bring something else to the table. So you previously did a feature called She's Lost Control in English, uh, which came out six years ago. Uh, so I'm wondering what you've been doing uh, in the time between then and the girlfriend experience. I have written many, many screenplays. I was attached to direct um, based on, on the scripts that I have not written. 
one project got very close to actually getting made and was in casting already fully financed. But as these things go, you know, some, some things you, you, you're very close, but they're not meant to happen. What I find interesting is that at the end of the day, no matter what, what you're working on, whether it actually um, moves in, into production, there's always that creative energy that gets somehow recycled and, and turned into something else. And I, I you know, I, I've enjoyed the process. Um, I've found my writing skills and it's, uh, it, when the time came and I got the call, um, I was ready to play on that bigger canvas that is the world of the girlfriend experience. What do you think you wish you knew going into the girlfriend experience, like making a TV show? Great question. I mean, we all, you know, grow with our, with the challenges that are presenting themselves to us. I've certainly enjoyed the sort of the larger scope. I've, you know, enjoyed tremendously working with a larger team and, and with a strong visual effects component. That was something I had never done before. So embracing all that was just really fun. And, I was lucky to be able to bring a couple of really trusted collaborators with me, you know, such as um, editor Nick Carew, DOP Zachary Geller, and, and a number of other people. And it was just really a wonderful experience. We're all really grateful to have a job in 2020. Um, so yeah, I can't, I, I don't, um, I don't, I look back only with, uh, with a big smile. Let's talk about your lead, uh, Julia goldani Uh What did you see in her that made you want to cast her for this role? I saw her spunk, uh, her smarts, and her, you know, sort of, she's a trained um, athlete in a previous life, and I just saw that ability to pivot really quickly. And it, I mean, it's, there's a physicality to it, but it's also mental and emotional, and I think, I thought, that's exactly what, what Iris needs um, because she is such a chameleon in a way going in and, and there's almost like a performative aspect to her um, putting on different personas. Yeah, this is a stilted performance, but that's actually by design. Uh, so can you tell me about crafting it? I think the idea was really to sort of continue um, within the larger story world of, of um, the girlfriend experience, the show, and also give Iris as a character um, a groundedness that would ultimately allow the, the audience to really understand what's driving her and what's, um, what's allowing her to take a giant leap at the end of the season. And um, for, for Iris, I think it has to do with her family backstory and her own trajectory. Um, you know, as she sort of gets a glimpse into the, into the future, both technologically, but also in her personal life, which has, has to do with her own, um, can't give away too much, but it has to do with who, how she was made. And um, so giving her that freedom to, to um, you know, bump up against these hardships, I think was really important for, for us to ground the performance in, in something that ultimately is very human and relatable because we're all struggling with the same thing. We're all struggling with how far do we let algorithms into our lives? How, how much of who we are is being mirrored back to us and, and reinforced and directed perhaps by, by technology? Now, I asked Julia this question uh, a few weeks ago and didn't go over too well. Uh, so I'm gonna come to you now. Uh, I think that it's fair to say that Iris is not ashamed of her profession. Uh, you know, she takes pride in it, but on the other hand, she does keep it a secret from her family. So what's going on there? I think the non-judgmental approach to the franchise was tremendously important. You know, we don't judge what any of these characters are doing. Um, that was sort of a parameter that was clear on, on the network level. And, you know, Steven Soderbergh certainly always had that approach. Um, and I had that approach in my film, She's Lost Control. So that was a given, that was non-negotiable, but In terms of Iris's arc, I think it's not that she's ashamed. It's that her family is dealing with bigger fish. And I think she does become a caretaker in a way, even though she you know, makes a giant leap and, and relocates to another continent. She ultimately has her, 
the focus of, of what's really going on between them is happens on another level. So I think it would be fair to say that that her um, endeavors as a uh, transactional relationship facilitator, um, they play into a very different dynamic and she she ultimately has to figure out how to um, make choices for herself that are kind of tough choices. And again, I, at the end of the season, I think there's a giant leap that happens. And I think my goal in all of this was, was to help or it was to tell a story where the audience would in the end understand why she's making this crazy choice. Because it's it's kind of a choice that we're all having to to make down the line. You know, it's uh, this morning. It's funny that we're talking today because there was an announcement that uh, Google's DeepMind had had um, announced that you know, uh, general artificial intelligence was apparently achievable with with a technological means that that are already there. So we're we're getting closer and closer to something um, very uncanny. So you're paying attention to real world news like that. How much are you paying attention to just, you know, what other uh, TV shows have done? Making sure that you're not doing something that's already been done on Black Mirror or Westworld or something. Yeah, I mean, that's always a consideration. And I think we, I, I think as filmmakers, we're just, there's a component to any art, I think, where, where we're just a medium, a channel for, for, you know, ideas that are floating around in the zeitgeist. And I think for me, the exciting part is really about putting it together in a, in a way that's um, different from, from how other people have done it. I think nothing of what's presented in, in the Girlfriend Experience season three is technologically unheard of or, or um, completely um, science fiction. Everything that they're working on is is grounded in reality, and so I've I've researched that quite a bit. I'm I'm equal in equal parts terrified and um, obsessed with it, and um, the pres- the opportunity has you know definitely Black Mirror has opened the the floodgate in so many ways, and they've done such great work. And I think um, what was fun for season three was to infuse the world of the girlfriend experience with a very sort of um, open-ended question that has to do with with the most intimate parts of, of our um, being, you know, humanness, like how how far do we allow technology to to sort of enter our our intimate spaces? So going off the packaging and presentation then, what are the visual rules of the show this season? Uh, I think the packaging, I mean, it made me sound like you're talking about the trailer and the poster. I'm, I'm super, um, like, I, I think that's its own art form. And I was so happy to, you know, when the trailer came out, I feel like it really presents the tone of the show and of the season really well. Um, I think the idea is always to create something that's unique to the story you're telling. And we didn't have any specific rules that were, you know, that we didactically followed. It was really a pretty fluid process between different departments. And um, I think there, there was a dedication to um, creating different looking pockets of reality for all of Iris's interactions with her clients and to infuse the tech world with something that wasn't just sterile, but that would grow over time as the season progresses and becomes more organic. Um, And to, uh, yeah, to ground the uncanny, to create that intricate balance between, you know, completely out there, um, you know, taking a couple of leaps and, and just the gritty, messy feelings that we all have and, and let Iris navigate that. So season two was four years ago. Uh, I thought the show was done at that point, but now that you are back, uh, is there talk about season four with you? I think that's, um, you know, a conversation that will be had. It's, it's always uh, interesting to see how, how, um, TV, TV stories continue in their own way. I think they're 
could be potential for season further seasons that you know open up new story worlds i think um i, I can only speak about season three but uh, you know i think the the science fiction angle my goal was always to um to sort of close the loop at the end of, of the season and deliver a satisfying ending in episode 10. So I think it's safe to say that Iris is, um, she's not going to be a, uh, a hologram at, at Walmart anytime soon. Although that, that would hypothetically be with a fun season four. If, okay. if the product she's creating has been completely commercialized. All right. Uh, okay, Anya, well, thanks very much for taking the time today to chat with Gold Derby. Thank you, Riley. Great questions. Mm -hmm.